In today's video, we're doing a very in-depth, detailed exploration and comparison of the inline 4, the V4, and the Boxer 4 engine. So the three main configurations of four-cylinder engines. Now, uh, before we can do a comparison, we have to do what we always do in engine balance videos, and that is to explain the concepts of primary and secondary engine balance. Now, if you're familiar with the series and have heard all of this already and you don't want to hear it again, you can click here to skip. Otherwise, just keep watching. Okay, first up, primary balance. Uh, as you know, the piston is moving up and down. Uh, well, you could say that in the box, it's moving side to side, and in the V4, it's moving at some sort of angle, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that the piston is changing direction all the time. And if you get any object which has some sort of mass and you try to get it to change direction, you will see that the object resists this change in direction and it wants to keep moving in the same direction. This is called inertia. Now, you can experience and feel inertia yourself, uh, just get any object which has a relatively significant mass for its relatively compact size. An external battery pack like this one will do just fine. And then put it in your hand and then move it in one direction. And then try to suddenly change the object's direction of motion. You will see that you have to exert extra force with your hand uh, to change the object's direction compared to the amount of force you need uh, to keep the object moving in the same direction. In other words, you have to apply more force to change direction because you have to overcome the object's inertia. But here's the deal. Uh, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So when you're applying force onto the object to change its direction, the object is also applying force onto your hand. And in this scenario, your hand is the connecting rod and the object is the piston. And just like the object applies force onto your hand when it changes direction, so too does the piston apply force onto the entire engine when it changes direction. The direction of the force is in the direction of the piston's travel before it changed direction. So the forces point up at top dead center and down at bottom dead center. In other words, as the engine is running, a primary imbalance will shake slash vibrate the engine up and down at the same speed as the RPM of the engine. Now, to have a smooth engine with good primary balance, we have to balance out the forces associated with a piston's inertia. Now, the inline 4 achieves perfect primary balance by using inertial forces of one piston to balance out the inertial forces of another piston. So, what we have is two pistons going up and two pistons going down. This means that we have two primary forces pointing up and two primary forces pointing down. We have forces of equal magnitude but opposite direction, so they can cancel each other out. Now, the Boxer 4 engine also achieves perfect primary balance by using piston masses to balance out other piston masses. It just does it a bit differently. Instead of having all the pistons in one line, the Boxer 4 splits them into two separate banks, which are directly opposed to each other, which means that the pistons are also, of course, opposed to each other. By putting each piston onto its own crank pin, we can ensure that the pistons move in and out together. So when one piston is at top dead center, so is the opposing piston. And so when one piston exerts a force at top dead center, the other one does too. Because the pistons oppose each other, the forces do too. So each piston pair makes two forces of equal magnitude but opposite direction, which means that the forces of each pair cancel each other out and eliminate any primary vibrations. Now, the V4 engine also achieves perfect primary balance, but it doesn't use piston masses to balance out other piston masses. Instead, it uses the crankshaft counterweight. And the reason why it can use the crankshaft counterweight to balance out pistons is precisely because it's a V engine. If it weren't a V engine, then the counterweight couldn't be used for the purposes of achieving perfect primary balance. Now, if we observe a single cylinder engine, we can see that when the piston is at top dead center or at bottom dead center, the crankshaft counterweight does indeed directly oppose the piston and it can balance it out. But the piston, it only moves up and down, it only reciprocates, while the crankshaft only rotates. This means that when we rotate the engine to 90 or 270 degrees, then the piston and the crankshaft counterweight point in different directions and they cannot balance each other out. But in a V engine with 90 degrees between the two cylinder banks, the crankshaft counterweight can be used to balance out both pistons. When one piston is atop its center, it's opposed by the crankshaft counterweight. When the engine rotates 90 degrees, the other piston comes up to top dead center and the crankshaft counterweight now opposes that piston and balances it out. The additional bulk that can be observed in V4 crankshaft counterweights is physical evidence of this additional task of the V4 crankshaft. 
But the V4 isn't just different in the way it achieves perfect primary balance. It's also a lot more modular compared to inline 4 and Boxer 4 engines. In fact, you would be forgiven if you said that all inline 4 and Boxer 4 engines are, you know, the same. Uh, and this is because you can only play around with the bore and stroke a bit, but the basic crankshaft design and thus the basic cylinder layout is always the same for all of these engines. This is not the case for the V4 where you can play around with all sorts of things in the basic engine anatomy and configuration. The typical V4 engine, if that even exists, has 90 degrees between the two cylinder banks and two conrods sharing one crankpin. And this enables the crankshaft counterweight induced perfect primary balance we just explained, but it also creates a problem that doesn't exist on the inline 4 and the Boxer 4. And the problem is an uneven firing interval. Now in a four stroke engine, we need 720 degrees of engine rotation to complete one full combustion cycle. So we need 180 degrees for intake, 180 degrees for compression, 180 degrees for combustion, and 180 degrees for exhaust. This tells us that a single cylinder fires every 720 degrees of rotation. Now in a four cylinder engine, we obviously have four cylinders. So if we divide 720 by four, we get 180. And this tells us that in a four cylinder engine, we need to fire a cylinder every 180 degrees of rotation to achieve an even firing interval. Now, because both the inline 4 and the Boxer 4 have 180 degrees of separation between their crank pins, they also have 180 degrees of separation between individual combustion cycle events, leading to an even firing interval for both of these engines. And this is in most cases desirable because it leads to a smooth running engine with reduced vibrations. But a shared crank pin V engine results in a separation between the combustion events of two pistons and cylinders that is equal to the number of degrees of the angle between the two banks of the V. Let's imagine that the angle of our V4 engine is 90 degrees. If we put two conrods on the same crank pin, then the separation between combustion cycle events of the two pistons equals 90 degrees. That's the bank angle. Now, when a piston is at top dead center, it can either be at the beginning of combustion or the end of the exhaust stroke. So let's imagine we just started combustion in cylinder one. This means that the other cylinder is either 90 degrees or halfway through the compression stroke, or it's halfway through the exhaust stroke. This means that we can fire the other cylinder either 90 or 450 degrees after we fire the first cylinder. And obviously, neither one of these is 180 degrees, resulting in a situation where one gap between two combustion events is shorter or longer than the other. Or in other words, we have an uneven firing interval. But as we said, the V4 engine is modular. It essentially consists of two equal V-twins stuck together. And this means that you can play with all sorts of different things. The angle of the V doesn't have to be 90 degrees like in the Ducati Panigale V4. It can be 70 degrees like in the Yamaha VMAX or 65 degrees like in the Aprilia RSV4. You can even play with the offset between the two V-twins. You can have zero offset like in the Honda RC30, for example or 180 degrees of offset like in the VFR 800, or 70 degrees like in the Ducati Panigale V4. But no matter the configuration, the firing interval will always be uneven. However, the upside is that you can play with the unevenness to create different firing intervals resulting in different engine characters, sound, and power delivery, which can be tailored to match different applications. Now, the inline 4 and the Boxer 4 firing intervals may be even, but they can't be anything else, and you really can't do anything about it. Now, you might have noticed that we're only mentioning motorcycles in relation to the V4 engine, and this is because V4 engines are relatively common in motorcycles, but extremely rare in cars. And of course, this is because the uneven firing interval induced vibrations are seen as undesirable, you know, for a car where we want to be isolated from engine vibrations. We want, you know, as little engine vibrations as possible for a more comfortable feeling, you know, in a car. The only car with a V4 engine that I can think of from the top of my head is the Ford Taunus V4. And even that isn't a proper V4 because Ford used a split crankpin design. So each Conrad gets its own crankpin. And this is because that's the only way to achieve an even firing interval on a V4 engine and get rid of the undesirable vibrations. But on a motorcycle, we're sitting, you know, inches away from the engine. So a bit of vibrations is both, you know, tolerable and expected. However, an uneven firing interval can be more than just tolerable on a motorcycle engine. It can even be something desirable because it can help the motorcycle achieve better rear tire grip.
An uneven firing interval increases the gap between power pulses coming from the engine, which can translate into recovery gaps for the rear tire. In other words, we're giving the rear tire a bit more room to breathe, which helps it recover and regain traction. This then leads to more manageable and more predictable handling during corner exit, and can also help prevent a sudden loss of traction, which might otherwise occur if the tire was subjected to a constant barrage of power pulses. An uneven firing interval is also one of the reasons why, for example, Harley Davidson motorcycles became flat track legends, and why single cylinder motorcycles with large gaps between power pulses often perform better in a low traction environment compared to twin cylinder motorcycles. But an uneven firing interval isn't just good in the dirt. It can also be useful on paved surfaces where high-powered sport bikes have more than enough power to break traction on the rear wheel during corner exit even when the rider isn't trying to get this to happen. The Ducati Panigale V4 is a nice example of what can be called a big bang firing order. We have two cylinders fired in quick succession followed by a big gap and then the other two cylinders fired in quick succession. This not only creates a big recovery gap but it also simulates the uneven character of a V4 to an engine, which is something that many Ducati buyers love and expect. Okay, so that covers primary balance and the firing intervals. Now let's move on to secondary balance. Again, if you want to skip this part, click here. Now, when trying to understand secondary balance, it really helps to observe and think about secondary balance completely separately from primary balance. And primary balance is all about the regular motion of the engine, uh, you know, the motion of the piston that is a consequence of the rotation of the crankshaft. And for a brief moment, I want you to forget all of that. Forget that the piston is going up and down, slowing down, and then accelerating again at top and bottom, that's center. Instead, I need you to focus on secondary balance alone, and that is just what the connecting rod is doing to the piston. And what the connecting rod is doing is that it's effectively changing its length in relation to the line between the piston and the crankshaft center. So at top dead center and at bottom dead center, the connecting rod is fully upright and it's at its longest in relation to the line between the piston and the crankshaft. At 90 and 270 degrees of rotation, the connecting rod is fully angled or it's at its shortest in relation to the piston and the crankshaft. Now, when the connecting rod is becoming shorter, it's bringing the piston and the crankshaft center closer together. In other words, it's effectively pulling the piston down towards the crankshaft center. And this is why secondary forces at 90 and 270 degrees when the connecting rod is at its shortest, they point downward. Now, when the connecting rod is becoming upright, it's becoming longer, so it's bringing the piston and the crankshaft center further away from each other. In other words, it's effectively pushing the piston up away from the crankshaft center. And this is why secondary forces at top and bottom that center when the connecting rod is at its longest, they point upward. So with this in mind, let's observe the secondary balance of the inline 4. And if you look at it as it's rotating, it almost immediately becomes obvious that the inline 4 has a problem with secondary balance. And this is because when two pistons are at top dead center, the other two are at bottom dead center. And also all four pistons are at mid stroke at the same time. This means that all four connecting rods are either fully upright or fully angled at the same time. And this means that all secondary forces point in the same direction all the time, so they can't cancel each other out. In fact, they stack up, leading to noticeable secondary vibrations in an inline 4 engine. But there's good news and there's bad news when it comes to secondary vibrations. The good news is that the magnitude of secondary vibrations and forces only amounts about one quarter that of primary forces. And this is because secondary forces arise only from the little tiny acceleration created by the connecting rod. But primary forces arise from the main acceleration created by the rotation of the engine, which is why they're stronger. The bad news is that, uh, as we know, a piston can only reach top or bottom dead center once for every revolution. And this is why primary vibrations also occur only once for every engine revolution. But as we know, the connecting rod changes shape from fully upright to fully angled twice every engine revolution. And this is why secondary vibrations also occur twice for every engine revolution. So at uh, 7,000 RPM, for example, we have 14,000 secondary vibrations occurring in the engine, leading to a very annoying buzzing sensation coming from the engine, which in some cases can loosen bolts or even damage the engine if the frequency and magnitude of secondary vibrations is allowed to get high enough.
Fortunately, both primary and secondary vibrations can be eliminated with the usage of balance shafts. But balance shafts are really just a necessary evil. They do get rid uh, of the vibrations, but they do so at the expense of increased friction, increased number of moving parts, increased cost and complexity. And some inline fours do indeed use balance shafts to get rid of secondary vibrations, but others don't. They simply leave the secondary vibrations as they are, and they just aim to reduce the amount of vibrations that reaches vehicle occupants through the usage of isolation and clever designs of engine mounts. Now, in the case of the 90 degree V4, when one piston is at top dead center, the other one is at the halfway point of its stroke. So that means that when one connecting rod is fully upright, the other one is fully angled. So we have one secondary force point up and the other one point down. Unfortunately, because of the V shape of the engine, the forces don't directly oppose each other. So they don't cancel out, but they also don't stack up like in the inline four. Instead, they create a result force which is at 90 degrees or perpendicular to the center line between the two cylinder banks. Now the magnitude of this force is about 1.4 times the magnitude of uh, a secondary force of a single cylinder, which means that the overall secondary vibrations in a V4 are inherently lower than in an inline 4. Now what we can also do in a V4 is set the angle between the crank pins to 90 degrees. In this scenario, the resultant secondary force from the second or the rear pair of cylinders is in opposite direction from the resultant secondary force of the first pair of cylinders. So you would think that the two forces cancel out because they're equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Unfortunately, they don't cancel out. Instead, they create something known as a rocking couple. Now, a rocking couple is two forces equal in magnitude opposite in direction, but separated by a perpendicular distance. Now let's imagine that our two fingers are two forces. If we apply these two equal forces from opposite directions onto an object, we'll see that the forces cancel each other out and the object goes nowhere. But if we separate our two forces by a perpendicular distance and again apply them onto the object, the object now rotates. And this is what a rocking couple is trying to do to the engine. It is constantly trying to rotate the crankshaft and thus the engine around, leading to undesirable vibrations or even potential damage. So we don't want this, but there's a way to alleviate it. We can set the offset to 70 degrees like the Ducati Panigale. And by doing this, we skew the secondary force of the rear pair of cylinders ever so slightly away from the opposite direction from the front pair of the cylinders. This means that now we don't have a perfect rocking couple anymore, leading to somewhat less noticeable vibrations. But these vibrations weren't that bad in the first place. As we said, secondary vibrations come from secondary forces and secondary forces are weak and made even weaker by the fact that motorcycle engines use small and very lightweight pistons. So the fact that the V4 engine doesn't amplify secondary vibrations like the inline four and instead dilutes them makes them barely noticeable and takes them outside the realm of balance shaft necessity. So what about the boxer four? When one piston is at top dead center, so too is the opposing piston. In the rear pair of the pistons, when one is at bottom dead center, the other one is also at bottom dead center. So we have equal forces of opposite direction that should cancel each other out. Well, unfortunately, no, because we have, again, perpendicular distance or separation between the opposing pistons. Each piston pair creates a rocking couple. And because each piston pair is making upward forces, we're having two rocking couples which rotate in the same direction. So they sort of stack up. Now, again, secondary forces are low, so fortunately the boxer engine can get away without balance shafts, but it does need clever engine mount design and placement. Now, something else you might be wondering is whether the cylinder offset present in the Boxer 4 engine also creates a primary rocking couple. And the answer is that, interestingly enough, it doesn't. Remember, primary forces point up at top dead center and down at bottom dead center. This means that both the front and the rear pair of cylinders create their own rocking couples. But this time, the rocking couples rotate in different directions. In fact, they rotate in opposite directions. The front one is counterclockwise and the rear one is clockwise in this case, which means that they effectively cancel each other out. The same thing actually happens in the inline four. Each cylinder pair does create a rocking couple, but they again rotate in opposite directions. You can actually visualize this uh, again using a simple rectangular object. Try and rotate each half of the object in a different direction. What you're trying to do is actually to either break apart the object or fold it inwards, but because you obviously can't generate anywhere near enough force to break a battery pack in half, the object simply remains stationary.
A great example of a pretty bad primary rocking couple would be a flat four engine that isn't a boxer engine. Now, in a flat engine that isn't a boxer, the connecting rods share a crank pin. This means that when one piston is at top dead center, the other one is at bottom dead center, giving us a distribution of primary forces that looks like this. And as you can see, they're of equal magnitude and equal direction, which means that they stack up in each cylinder pair. These big stacked up primary forces of each cylinder pair are then separated by a pretty noticeable perpendicular distance, leading to one hell of a primary rocking couple, which explains why all mainstream mass-produced flat four engines are also boxers. By giving each rod its own crank pin, we essentially convert the massive primary rocking couple into a much less noticeable secondary couple. So which is the best engine configuration of the three? Well, this is a question I get asked in the comments a lot. Which is the best engine? Which is the best this or that? Uh, there's no such thing. There's no best engine, no best car, no universally best anything. There's only best for a certain application and set of priorities. Let's say that you were designing some sort of sporty car that's supposed to go quickly and dynamically through the corners. In this case, the lower center of gravity created by the boxer engine would be a significant advantage, and you might pick this engine for your car. But if you were designing uh, some sort of compact, small city car, which is going to spend most of its life in city streets and, you know, navigating, I don't know, tight parking spaces or whatever, then the bulky nature, the wide nature of the boxer engine, which would likely increase the width of the car itself, would be a big disadvantage and you probably wouldn't pick it because the low center of gravity isn't really important on a small, compact, cheap city car. So what I'm trying to say is that changing applications lead to changing priorities, which lead to changing weight of each advantage or disadvantage, and this then ultimately leads to a particular engine configuration choice. So if there isn't a universally best anything, let's ask a different question. Why is the inline 4 the most widespread configuration of the three? Well, this is because uh, it can suit most applications well, and it's also the most cost-effective engine. It's the most, uh, the least expensive to manufacture because uh, unlike the Boxer 4 and the V4, which have two sets of heads, two sets of cams, uh, two chains or belts, the inline 4 just has one, one head, one set of cams, and one belt. This means that it's, it reduces friction, reduces complexity, and reduces cost. And it's also cheaper to service. Also, it's usually the most compact engine, which makes it the most easy, you know, to package into a particular vehicle. And uh, this then gives you also usually the easiest access for servicing. The Boxer 4 may have better engine balance than the inline 4, but what prevents it from being widespread is cost and complexity. And cost not just because of the two heads like in the V4. The Boxer 4 is even worse than the V4 because its engine block needs to be cast from two halves. Both the inline 4 and the V4 can have a single block casting. And something that is bolted together, you know, from two halves is almost never as rigid as something that is cast and borne as one single part. Also, the Boxer 4 needs by far the long longest chains or belts to drive the cams, and it also often requires the most complex and expensive exhaust manifold designs. Another issue that I like to address is that many people believe that the boxer engines, popular boxer engines like the Subaru EJ20 or EJ25 are inherently weak and that they can't make uh, big power. The reality isn't that they're inherently weak, is that um, the reality is that they have a much smaller margin for error. Uh, I mean, some parts are weak, but they're not weak because of all quality. Uh, they're weak because of the inherent design constraints of a Boxer 4. Remember, we have that secondary rocking couple. And to minimize the effects of that rocking couple to get away without having balancing shafts, the Boxer 4 needs to minimize the spacing, the perpendicular distance, or the offset between two cylinders. And to minimize this offset, the Boxer 4 must employ very thin crankshaft webs and very narrow bearings. Uh, and this leads to of course, a you know weaker crankshaft, a thin web is easier to break than a thick one, and a narrow bearing has a less load bearing surface than a wide bearing. If you put a box of four crankshaft next to an inline four, you see that I mean the differences become painfully obvious. So when you up the boost and make big combustion forces that then push onto the crankshaft in a box of four, you end up with a much smaller margin for error, and you better be knowing what you're doing if you don't want to have rod knock or a broken crankshaft or whatever.
Now, the V4 engine is also an exercise in choosing priorities. I may well say that it's the best engine for a motorcycle, but the reality is that there's no such thing as a benefit without some sort of drawback attached. For example, the V4 engine is narrower than an inline four, which makes the motorcycle more narrow, more aerodynamic, and allows more extreme lean angles. But the V4 is also longer than the inline four, which forces a longer wheelbase, which can then negatively impact motorcycle handling. Also, the V4 engine puts the rear two cylinders behind the front ones, which can make cooling the rear two cylinders, you know, difficult in some situations. But as many of you know, uh, the V4 engine has definitely made a name for itself in MotoGP. It's often used, and there's a reason why it's so desirable for motorcycles. And it's because it allows more precise, more organic, more manageable throttle control in a motorcycle. As we know, in an inline four, all four pistons are slowing down and speeding up together at the same time. This means that all the forces associated with the piston's inertia are being generated in two big evenly spaced out pulses, which occur at the top and bottom dead center, leading to crankshaft rotation being fast as there and slowest at 270 and 90 degrees of rotation. This pulsating force output or torque output interferes with the regular torque output generated by the combustion of the engine and results in mixed signals for the rider. In other words, this isn't what the rider is expecting when he or she twists the throttle. The rider wants an easily controllable, predictable linear torque output. The rider wants actually combustion torque that is rising along with the RPM in a predictable linear manner. Now, the V4 engine can get around this because it can be configured so that we never have all four pistons speeding up and slowing down together at the same time. The result is an evened out crankshaft speed throughout the entire revolution and a linear torque output. This feature of the V4 is in fact so desirable during corner exit throttle modulation that Yamaha made an uneven firing crossplane inline 4 just to mimic this characteristic of the V4 without having to increase the wheelbase. Another important benefit of the V4 is that the shared crank pin arrangement allows a very simple and very rigid crankshaft design. And this is definitely something that you want if you want to reach high RPM like motorcycles do. Also, the way that cylinders are distributed in the V4 uh, and the box 4 makes it easy to increase cylinder bore without increasing engine length. And this means that you can make pretty compact engines which are very over square, which can be very useful on motorcycles. On the inline 4, all the four cylinders are together next to each other in one line and this means that increasing cylinder bore almost immediately leads to increased engine length. And this is why on inline fours, it's usually easier to increase displacement by increasing the stroke. And there you have it. Three engine configurations, but hundreds of different applications and design choices to be made. I hope you enjoyed that and maybe even learned something new in the process. As always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.